Um, so today we'll hear, um, starting with Alejo Stark, who is a physicist, philosopher, and political militant who works and studies in the Rust Belt. For more than a decade, he's been active in abolitionist struggles as an undocumented organizer, interrupting deportations, supporting prisoner resistance in the wake of the prison strikes, and as a graduate student worker with the Graduate Employees Organization, GEO, which is at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Then we'll hear from Sophie Karasik, um, who's a progressive organizer and former director of education and co-founder of the National Group and Rape on Campus, where she helped spearhead the movement against campus sexual violence that made headlines from 2013 to 2017 and helped prime the public for Me Too. Uh, then we'll hear from both Britt Schrader and Joel Sabando, who are both juniors at Harvard College. Um, and they're both organizers with the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign. And then finally, we'll hear from Chloe Trong Jones, who's a PhD candidate in American Studies at NYU and a graduate fellow at CUNY Law School. She's part of the Cops Off Campus National Coalition and facilitates the Labor Working Group. Um, so each speaker is gonna you know, have some time to intro themselves and their work for about 10 minutes or so. Um, if you guys go a little bit over, that's totally fine also. Um, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. So please uh, drop your questions into the chat whenever they come up, we'll collect them for later. So Alejo, I'll pass it on to you first. Great, thanks, Christina. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Justine, for the for the intro and for the for the invitation as well. Um, I gotta say, I'm um, really interested in learning more about public health, but I'll maybe share some ways in which it's been helpful in some of the organizing we've been doing here at the University of Michigan, uh, particularly with the union, the grad student union, GEO. Um, and I gotta say, also, that I've been I've been at U Mich for a long while, haven't been able to kick me out just yet. So maybe a few more years, uh, I'll be here. So. Um, so maybe I'll just start by saying that, um, you know, one of the main sort of events in um, my personal, uh, you know, history recently here at the University of Michigan um, is the 2020 strike. Uh, do people know about the 2020 strike in the fall of 2020 by grad students at the University of Michigan? I can't see people's faces. I don't, tell us. No, okay, good. Um, so, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I think was really important about the strike is that, first of all, it was the first strike that we went on for uh, really most of our history since 1975. And uh, more importantly, the strike, I think, articulated two really important demands. Uh, as you can imagine, this is uh, the fall of 2020, right after the George Floyd rebellion and uprising. And of course, the mass um, sort of death that came in the wake of uh, the COVID pandemic. And so the strike uh, got started by articulating two demands. Uh, we asked for safe and just campus. Um, so we were able to articulate on the one hand, COVID related demands, you know, around robust, robust testing, um, having a universal option uh, for teaching extension to our graduation timelines, uh, subsidies for, for uh, caretakers and so on, um, as well as a repeal of international student fees. Uh, and we were able to articulate those with uh, policing demands, uh, nominally abolitionist demands to defund campus police, um, demilitarize campus police, uh, cutting ties with ICE, right? So our call to uh, make a safe and just campus, uh, try to bring together in, in many ways, uh, things that are sometimes seen as separate, right? Like, because we have this naturalized way in which we think about policing as being about safety, right? Even here at the University of Michigan, the police department is euphemistically called the uh, division of public safety and security, right? Um, so we conflate security with safety and, and, and safety with security, right? Um, but as a longtime abolitionist, Stevie Wilson says, uh, he you know, is incarcerated in Pennsylvania and you know, one of the claims he makes is, look, I am surrounded by cameras and prison walls and cages, uh, that's very secure, but I'm not in any way safe, right? Um, so I think the strike was really important for at least at some level making uh, really visible the idea that safety is not equal to security. Um, 
there's a long history in this small liberal Ann Arbor town uh, of, of racist policing, as you can imagine, no matter what the mayor tells you um, and what local politicians tell you. Um, and, you know, one of the main things we uh, were able to bring to light at the time was also the fact that John Cito, the chief of police, when Ara Rosser was murdered uh, in 2014, um, a black artist and woman, um, um, a, a mother of three, uh, who was literally um, um, murdered within seconds of police and other police entering her home in 2014. The police chief at the time uh, immediately left and then was hired by the university, right? So there's a long sort of history and continuity between the violence of policing and the university. Um, and that's just one aspect of it, right? So we went on strike for longer than a week. It was the longest strike in our in our history. It was the longest strike since we got started as a union in 1975. Um, and as is perhaps expected, <laughs> they used the uh, criminal injustice system against us and threatened to file an injunction to basically sue our union out of, out of existence um, after uh, the second week of, of being on strike. Um, unfortunately, that ended the strike. Um, and what we were able to get out of the policing, at least, aspect of it, or the abolitionist aspect of it, uh, was merely a task force. And we know uh, what task force do. They do very little. <laughs> but from going from nothing, right, uh, the university would not sit and talk with us about policing. Uh, we got we got a task force um, out of it, which, again, did nothing. But uh, two years down the line, uh, fast forwarding to today, we now have uh, some language through which we can leverage and continue to fight for abolition on campus and, and, and in the broader community um, because in their um, strike agreement document, the document the university typed up and gave uh, the union to sign said that while policing is not a subject of bargaining, that is while policing is not something that you can bargain over because you know police are workers, as they say, uh, and we can't bargain for other workers, um, it turns out that nonetheless, they said policing is a public health hazard, a public health concern, right? That's what the university said in the next line, right? So uh, if it's a public health concern, then it therefore uh, means that the safety and health of our union members, other grad student workers, um, is part of what we can bargain over, right? And therefore, we can bargain for policing. So that's a strategy we're trying out this time around, um, and we'll let you know how that goes, um, because we're about to vote on our um, bargaining platform today, and we're going to start bargaining next week, actually. We have a big rally coming up next week. Um, and what we're asking for this time around is specifically for the university to fund a non-police unarmed response, uh, which again will be something that is as far as I as far as I can tell, very um, unprecedented in terms of what unions can bargain for, um, and we're very lucky to have a team of abolitionist comrades here in Ann Arbor and Washington County, more generally in Southeast Michigan, uh, that started this coalition a few years ago called the Coalition for Reenvisioning Our Safety, which is precisely developing a non-police unarmed response for all sorts of situations, including um, you know mental health. Um, as well as other situations of harm uh, in lieu of having police respond, right? So this would be a separate institution from the police. And we want the university to fund that. We want the university to throw its multi-billion, you know, some of its multi-billion dollar endowment into funding this, right? So that's what we're fighting for. Um, we didn't get uh, much last time around, but it gave us a little window precisely by sort of framing this as a public health um, issue that we're gonna try to fight for this, this upcoming year. So. Um, that's kind of where we're at, um, and I'll be happy to talk more about sort of uh, organizing in, in general, but also organizing in terms of um, unions um, as well. That's awesome. Thanks, Alejo. And yeah, it's super interesting to hear th that they framed it as a public health issue, um, and I do hope that that's helpful in the bargaining. Um, Sophie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, thanks so much. Um, really cool to hear about the work that you're doing, Alejo. Um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing from other folks as well. Um, my name is Sophie Krasik. I use she, her pronouns. And right now I'm in Brooklyn, New York, um, but 
have been living in Denmark for most of the pandemic. Uh, I have a background as a progressive organizer, mostly in the sexual violence, survivor justice spaces, and also in climate justice advocacy. Uh, I have been in this space for almost 15 years. Uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking more about um, kind of like the evolution <laughs> that I think is happening now in the sexual violence survivor justice space in particular, or at least conversations that have started to percolate in the last few years about uh, abolition or non-carceral and non-punitive approaches. And yeah, I think if I just bring it back to my own um, my own experience or my own kind of evolu personal evolution around this, um, it basically, I started organizing in 2013 around sexual assault on college campuses being a national issue and like connecting with other survivors around the country to try and show that this was a widespread problem that sexual violence was happening on college campuses and it wasn't isolated to any particular part of the country or type of school. And we had like a pretty clear goal uh, of trying to create a consensus in popular opinion that that was an issue, uh, but we didn't really engage very much with what the solutions to that problem should be or what the causes of it were. Uh, and kind of, I think, let the kind of white feminist ecosystem or approach of like, in order for this to in order for us to have rape taken seriously, we must engage with punitive, uh, punitive approaches. That's what it means to take rape seriously. Uh, I think that definitely influenced our movement and definitely influenced me personally. Um, so I think, yeah, my evolution in terms of kind of coming around from realizing that, oh, actually having a punitive response to sexual harm is not survivor centered um, or a solely, you know, um, I think maybe somebody is unmuted. Um, but anyway, so basically, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of my like, approach shifting around that was when I read this study called Justice from the Victim's Perspective by Dr. Judith L. Herman, who's a psychiatrist who wrote this book called Trauma and Recovery and uh, some other stuff folks might be familiar with. And basically she interviewed survivors about what justice actually would look like from their perspective and found that a lot of the time it was validation from the community or like a transfer of the shame uh, that survivors often feel after experiencing sexual harm. Uh, and yeah, that just kind of acknowledgement that harm happened and like, I'm a person, I'm worthy. I I didn't deserve this to have hap to happen to me. And like, yeah, just the level of empathy that um, the punitive system often directly uh, incentivizes us against. So first, I think it was just kind of like this new lens or this new perspective of like, hey, I feel as though in the survivor justice movement for the last, or for like a three to five year period had really been saying that we were survivor centered. But that was really sent, that was really like ultimately fitting in this kind of box of like expulsions and suspensions, but not really taking a step outside of that and being like, well, from like a values perspective or a, you know, just like human to human, what is it that you really feel like you need? It's like, that wasn't the fundamental question that we were asking. So I, I feel like in terms of my own evolution, it really started there. Uh, and then I wrote an op-ed about it that got a lot of resonance from people. And I was like, okay, <laughs> seems like there's something here. Um, and I think especially during the uprisings in 2020 around the murder of George Floyd, that it became even clearer that like, oh, okay, 
this narrative of like policing and prisons um, being equated to public safety in cases of sexual harm and sexual violence is actually, yeah, it's, it, we actually can't continue to be a, a justification for this um, as survivors of sexual violence. Um, so yeah, I think that like, that's kind of the evolution that I had personally around it was like just being grounded in the experiences that I was seeing of other survivors and of myself, honestly. I think um, I had to reflect honestly on what it was that I would have really wanted uh, from the sexual violence out of the like um, response from the university when I had experienced um, sexual harm, you know, it's just like, oh, okay, what I actually really wanted was for this person to never do this again, ever. That was like the main thing that I remember saying. Uh, and yeah, just that that was not, um, that was not what the like intervention system provided by the university was designed to do. So yeah, that's kind of like my, my background in terms of that. Um, but I think in terms of like movement building more generally, if I, like, if I could go, if I could go back um, to, to campus, it's been like seven years since I was on campus. Um, so it's been quite a long time. Um, and I think it would have been really helpful for me to have understood that like, our ultimate goal was to shift the way that the public was thinking about um, about sexual violence to like have the public actually be like in consensus that there was a problem um, and to try and think more strategically about, okay, what is it that we would have wanted uh, to have happen once there was consensus? <laughs> um, so that's one thing. But all things considered, I mean, we were like in our early 20s and just winging it a lot of the time. I think that we did do pretty well. Um, I think other advice that I would give to people is just like centering storytelling and like people's lived experiences. But I, I feel like this is stuff that hopefully a lot of people know. But anyways, yeah, I think that uh, I have evolved a lot on this topic in the last five years and I yeah I can feel it even now it's, it's like difficult for me to fully express like how how I feel about it but um, I'm yeah grateful to be here and to like speak in first draft about this to some degree uh, and yeah, to engage with people who are like-minded around this. Thanks, Sophie, super appreciate it. Um, yeah, and look forward to, to continuing to engage with you. I just appreciate the like idea that to be survivor-centered is not actually to be involving the criminal legal system often. Um, I feel like that's, that is a point that is often missing. So thank you for that. Um, cool. I'm gonna pass it off to Joel and Britt. Let me spotlight you both. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I'm Britt, um, and I'm an organizer with HPDC or the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign. And I also wanted to say as a quick comment to Sophie, I think all of us are kind of just in our young 20s winging it or I am at least when you're in the organizing in the organizing space. Um, and I'll let Joel introduce himself real quick and then we can talk a little bit about HPC's work. Yeah, hi, I'm Joel. I'm also a junior at Harvard. Um, I'm really happy to be here and I'm so happy to be in community with you all. And I want to say to both Sophie and Alejo that you guys are doing such great work. And I feel like it can be so difficult and kind of demoralizing sometimes and also really scary especially when you're young and you're students and 
you're fighting against what feels like a really difficult and like entrenched system. Um, but I think we're all there. Um, and I mean, I'm glad we're all here. So. Yeah, echoing that. Um, this work is beautiful and I'm really glad to be here. Um, so um, just talking a little bit about HPDC. So the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign, um, which I've been organizing with for about two years now, um, is a abolitionist divestment campaign um, focused on um, specifically Harvard's investments in the prison industrial complex. Um, it emerged in 2018 um, kind of on accident, which I think goes with the line of you organizing is very much as things come up sometimes, um, you realize there's a problem and then you start engaging with it. Um, a couple of students were doing research on um, Harvard's investments um, and uncovered their investments in the prison industrial complex. And um, as we're essentially like, this this is wrong, right? Um, with Harvard having the investment or the endowment of like 50 plus billion dollars. Um, and eventually it started off as a an awareness campaign um, and eventually evolved into um, a directly abolitionist um, organization fighting for Harvard's divestment and also serving um, other abolitionist organizations in the Boston community. Um, so essentially, kind of what the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign, our strategy is constantly evolving. I think that's something about um, organizing on campus is that there's every every couple of years people shift um, and people bring new ideas and new, new um, ways to bring attention um, to this. So for example, um, we had folks at the law school who, um, helped file um, a lawsuit against Harvard um, for for their investments in the prison industrial complex. We also um, have done direct actions um, where um, during like major events we we um, we protest in some form. We do service with other community organizations um, in the Boston community. Um, and I think that's something that is really important about kind of HPDC as a, a as a college centered um, abolitionist organization is that also this kind of dual recognition that um, the kind of I think what we were grounded in today, like the prison industrial complex um, is currently incarcerating people, uh, millions of people. And so grounding that work also outside of the outside of the university and in people that are directly impacted, um, whether that be like letter writing campaigns or pen pal campaigns um, through, I, I don't know if y'all know Black and Pink, but uh, it's a um, queer abolitionist organization. Um, and um, so a lot of what we do is really trying to focus, it's kind of, I would say like there are three tiers. One is like community education and campus education. So getting people talking about and um, talking about the prison industrial complex more broadly, but also specifically talking about Harvard's culpability in the prison industrial complex. Um, the other side is once we have people talking um, and within our work, how can we uh, make it to where the, the administrators kind of like Joel was mentioning, where the administrators care and hear our voices how can we bother them and be a persistent like um basically bother them into paying attention to us um and then um the third side which i um mentioned was um directly um serving other organizations in the community and so that that is a large focus of the hpdc and I'll turn to Joelle, who I think can talk a little bit more about um, us now and what we've been working on lately. Yeah, just give me one second. I think my cat got stuck in my um, dresser, so it may just be very loud. But yeah, so right now, uh, what we're kind of doing is uh, 
focusing on exposing some of Harvard's shady, um, let's say, obscuring of where they have their money held. Um, so there's there's a lot here. I'll, I'll try and give a brief rundown of it. But basically, uh, universities have typically put most of their money into private holdings, um, although they often also have some public holdings. Um, and because they're uh, nonprofits, they're required to file these um, kind of special taxes that detail loosely where they have their money invested. And so a big focus this semester has been going through Harvard's tax filings to focus, to figure out where their private holdings are. Uh, in the past, we had done a lot of work on Harvard's public holdings, but earlier this year, they sold them all off. Um, and so we completely lost access into like any information uh, about where they had their money held. But when when we did know what they had, we I think estimated they had almost ten million dollars directly invested in the prison industrial complex, and that was only in what I think was at the time three percent of their total holdings, which I think as of twenty twenty one are I think sixty billion dollars or something like that. Um, so. We've been working with uh, a lot of other organizations on campus looking into these taxes, and we've been covered a lot of what I feel like are pretty damning things. So things about tax structure, the basically a lot of ways that they're trying to obscure um, people like us looking into them. So they have six different subsidiary corporations that actually do all of the investing for them. Um, most of their investments are uh, are headquartered in the Cayman Islands. Some of them are tied exclusively to Harvard, but you know are kind of like hidden away. And some of them are also tied to, uh, how to put this? There are some journalists who seek to seek out uh, to figure out where dirty money is. Quite a few of the organizations are headquartered in places that are tied to some of the websites and databases that journalists have identified as. Um, being used for money laundering or for uh, drug trafficking and stuff like that. So pretty intense, uh, pretty intensely damning things, I think, that we've been looking into. And we've been we've been preparing a report uh, and we've been writing op-eds. And at Harvard, kind of the major event of the year is this big football game we have with Yale, uh, which is coming up in a few weeks. And um, we're trying to, in the next few days, really organize a kind of like major launch of this research, uh, of this uh, expose, really, an op-ed, uh, an action uh, to, co uh, to coincide with Harvard Yale when a lot of people are coming onto campus, not only from Yale, but actually all across the, com uh, the country, alumni. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what we've been doing most recently. Uh, and I guess something I think is relevant to note here is that for on-campus work, um, it often feels like it's kind of like the same 20 people in like a bunch of different orgs who are like spreading themselves kind of thin doing this sort of stuff. Um, but at, at the same time, I I think it's so helpful to look beyond kind of like just the, the single abolitionist lens and look to organizations that are doing similar work and finding people who are allied with you who can help you out when you have low capacity. I think part of the, the thing that comes about when one thinks about abolition is spreading abolitionist principles like to one's entire life. So giving oneself grace and also asking for help from others when you need it. And so I, I think Britt and I both have been really appreciative of people in Harvard's Palestine Solidarity Committee, people which is obviously uh, organizing in terms of Israel-Palestine conflict stuff. Um, or Harvard's uh, Act for a Dream, which is um, kind of like DACA, anti-I stuff, and then Harvard's Stop Land Grabs, which is focusing on a lot of different things, but primarily Harvard's um, real estate investments. Um, and um, I guess, yeah, so <laughs> that's all I have to say there. Awesome, thank you both. Um... Yeah, thanks for sharing all that. I think there are like many, many takeaway lessons from what you're saying, including like this is an organization that's lasted from 2018, even with a lot of student turnover. Um, so it's great to hear that. And um, 
definitely going to be sending solidarity for that Harvard Yale game. Um, cool. I will pass it on to Chloe now. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. And it's really great to be here and to hear from everyone. Um, I'm a grad student and a member of NYU GSOC. And I'm also part of the National Cops Off Campus Coalition, um, which is probably relevant to everybody here. Um, but it's a, it's a collective of students and, and educators and other university workers and organizations that are um, seeking to put forward alternatives to policing um, to help build a, a future university beyond punishment and violence. Um, just for like a little bit of background, the group emerged out of the um, University of California cost of living wildcat strikes um, and has since sort of been reorganized a couple of times. Um, currently it's composed of different working groups. Um, I facilitate the labor working groups. So I don't have like a ton of info about the current activities in the other working groups, um, but um, primarily my working group is trying to link different graduate unions um, that are organizing to get cops off campus or getting other types of law enforcement off campus. So Alejo, I'm super happy to hear about Michigan's efforts and um, would love for you or anyone to come and share your experiences and knowledge and contract language, et cetera, um, if you're interested. Um, if people have questions about the coalition itself, I'm happy to do my best to answer, but um, I'm mostly going to talk a little bit about um, NYU's 2020 strike um, and some of the lessons from this experience. And it really mirrors Alejo's experience, um, especially in terms of the importance of framing um, policing as a health concern. Um, but I'll do my best to sort of um, hopefully draw out other, other points. Um, but similarly, um, we were bargaining a contract in fall of 2020. I was on, in the bargaining committee. Um, we sort of felt similarly situated within um, the kind of political context of post George Floyd and, and the pandemic, um, which led to, um, you know, these kinds of abolition related demands feeling really urgent. Um, and I'll make one kind of uh, interesting distinction with NYU, which is that because it's a, an urban private university um, that has no formal contracts with any police force um, and no sort of armed security, Organizing around this issue was a little bit hard because we would often say, um, or we would often hear, there are no cops on campus because there is no campus. Um, so I think it really forced us to think about where the university begins and ends, so to speak. Um, and as a couple of, of you have kind of pointed to, we had to think about NYU, you know, also as a major real estate owner um, that is complicit in policing in these other ways through gentrification, um, through controlling the way that capital is concentrated and the way that public circulates through the city um, and through its, its research institutions, et cetera. NYU is also a, a private university of global reach which with campuses all over the world. Um, for instance, in Israel, um, in places like United Arab Emirates. So, you know, we were connecting it to struggles in, in Palestine. Um, in addition, NYU has a board composed of individuals like Larry Fink, who is the president of BlackRock, who among many other things is one of the largest investors in um, private detention in the border. So this was also sort of informed by um, some of the things that were going on with family separation at the time. Um, so these are just some of the, the things that we were thinking about um, to kind of politicize the involvement of NYU in issues of policing. Um, but in addition, of course, policing was also affecting the daily lives of our workers. Um, NYPD were all over campus without masks on. Um, students were facing immigration concerns associated with COVID. Um, we had one worker who uh, was reincarcerated at Rikers Island during the uh, bargaining because uh, of a technical parole violation. Um, so as some of you probably remember, this is the center of the center of the pandemic. Um, so we had a lot of workers experiencing the threat of racial state violence. Um, through kind of these like health concerns as well. Um, so I'm gonna kind of note like two things about this experience that I think um, were important for me. One is about the difficulties of organizing around this subject, um, kind of like within unions. Um, and the second has to do with some of the, the legal challenges we've faced, which Alejo kind of pointed to as well. Um, 
but starting with the legal challenges, as, as he noted, there are, are uh, rules about what is considered a mandatory subject of bargaining, um, things like wages, healthcare, working conditions, um, but employers are not required to bargain over non-mandatory subjects of bargaining, um, which is basically um, what is mandatory and what is not mandatory is essentially guided by, by precedent. So this um, category of, of what is a, a, a worker's concern has grown over time. And I think part of the effort is to kind of grow that, that legal category to include policing as something that affects workers and include uh, other things like racism and, and um, other aspects of sort of the police state. Um, and as was mentioned, there can be consequences if um, you kind of push these issues um, and they're not being recognized as mandatory. It can be considered bad faith bargaining. Um, so initially we did not get any response to NYU or any recognition. Um, and at some point a strike became imminent and you know, we were pressured both within the union and especially from uh, UAW, which is our parent union, to drop these demands. And as um, some people might know, UAW is a very large union that also represents police unions. So it's not necessarily in their interest to be centering um, these kinds of demands in a uh, public graduate student strike. Um, so we did, um, you know, this is, this is a solution that we kind of found later down the line. Um, we were the cops off campus contract campaign um, and we ended up reframing it as a health and safety uh, contract campaign um, so that we could frame these issues within a uh, health and safety framework um, and, and to argue that it was a mandatory subject. Um, so we collected testimonials around how police on campus affects mental health. We cited some of these instances in which police were on campus unmasked and not complying with COVID standards. Um, we talked about the effect of surveillance on workers. Um, NYU is a university that, you know, was, um, there was kind of an expose about the fact that NYPD was surveying Muslim student groups. Um, so we talked a little bit about that effect, that sort of chilling effect on Muslim student groups. Um, and we also made kind of overarching arguments about policing being contradictory to our safety as workers um, on a kind of broader, more fundamental scale. Um, this uh, is not like a precedented argument, as I said, in the sense that there is no like formal legal precedent. Um, at one point, some of us were eager to actually get NYU to call an injunction on our strike in order for NLRB to make a determination because we thought we had a favorable case to make policing um, a valid health concern because of the fact that there was this kind of COVID involvement. Um, so that um, didn't happen, but if anyone is sort of just interested in discussing like kind of legal avenues that we were looking at, I think that there are um, like really exciting ways to be able to, to argue that um, in a place like the NLRB. Um, and similarly to Michigan, we won a kind of task group. Uh, we were also successful in uh, removing ice from campus or getting at least provisions to remove ice from campus um, because it's a federal, organization, they can obviously force their way on campus um, with warrants and things like that. Um, but that was a, definitely a big win um, also to just gain this recognition of these issues. Um, and I think a lot of our success ultimately came from um, less from like the bargaining sessions and more from the groundwork of really making this essential demand on the picket, in the media. Um, and, you know, while we didn't get NYPD off campus in the way that we wanted, I think um, this moves a lot of campus organizing forward and I think um, also points to the fact that in general people are interested in, in kind of gaining a wider understanding of, of um, what, what it means for something to be like a workers issue or a labor issue. Um, and prior to this, I don't think we had a lot of um, examples of this in, in uh, grad union organizing specifically. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, note yeah, again, like a kind of internal organizing challenge, which is that while some students face the threat of policing, there is a difference in how um, students experiencing policing on campus. Um, one of the ways that I hear this being talked about is, is two-tier policing where primarily white students get sent to the Dean and students of colors are the ones who interface with police most often. Um, and so I think this poses really different challenges than organizing around something like wages, which um, conceivably affects students in a, in a universal way, even though we know that that's also not true. Um, 
because wages have different value to people who are in different sort of living conditions. Um, and so this, you know, this can be really difficult within a union organizing setting. And that's why I think um, it's important to one, center the voices of people who are directly impacted. So a lot of people didn't know that we had at NYU a large student body of formerly incarcerated people or that we had graduate students who were on parole or on probation um, and who you know, faced these kinds of um, challenges. So I think that that was really important in kind of winning over members of our unit to do something like make a risk of going on strike that was ambiguously legal. Um, and also, you know, standing up to, to UAW, um, which was, you know, encouraging people to drop these demands, um, pulling a lot of kind of sneaky moves, not giving us access to their lawyers and legal resources, things like that. Um, and then the other thing that I think is that a lot of people within unions feel very like isolated because these are kind of new issues that are coming up um, that people, you know, are, are kind of pushing their unions to consider. Um, and that's why I think groups like Cops of Campus, um, this type of meeting here are really important because I think uh, a lot of the kind of solidarity that people need to find won't come necessarily from their union because there can be a lot of opposition, um, but they'll find it, you know, if you go broader scale and you kind of seek support from, um, you know, other groups doing this nationally, um, people who have, you know, contract language that you can borrow, um, and other kind of coalitional support. Um, because I, yeah, I do, I do think that this, uh, while this was like exciting, it was also kind of, um, it was like a, a big lesson in, in um, yeah, I think like the risks, I think people who uh, you think are otherwise you know, progressive, like pro-union people, um, the kind of limits of that and where those limits and, and fears come from. Um, and yeah, I think the only solution to that really is like more and more solidarity um, and wider kind of pools of solidarity. Um, yeah, I think that's that's um, basically what I wanted to mention, um, but it's really interesting to sort of hear how many of our experiences um, resemble a lot of the experiences that um, all of the other panelists have, have spoken to as well. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. Yeah, definitely noting the common threads. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just like sitting with what you're saying about the organizing needing to happen sort of externally to the union, but also internally. Um, and yeah, just the like much bigger project that becomes. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Cool. Okay, so let's jump into Q and A time. Um, folks have questions, please begin to drop them in the chat. Um, I'll throw out an opening question if each of you can answer for one to two minutes each um, while we gather other questions. Um, so the first question I want to ask you all is what do you think the field of public health has to offer in support of and in solidarity with abolitionist campus organizing? If you want to maybe go in the order that you spoke. Yeah, that's a super important question. And it was really awesome to hear everybody. I mean, I feel like I have to, and I wish we could talk uh, <laughs> a lot more um, about some of these because there's a lot of technicalities and details about all this, right? That um, maybe it's better not to talk while it's being recorded. Okay, sorry, I just took like 20 seconds of my time to say that. But um, yeah, I think the, you know, at least for us in Michigan, and it seems like it was a case also with the NYU comrades as well, like framing policing, policing as a public health issue gives you a lot of leverage, right? Um, or could potentially give you a lot of leverage. Um, uh, by precisely what Clay was saying, right? You can kind of um, kind of stretch stretch what is a subject of bargaining, stretch what is permissible to fight over as a union, stretch what is permissible to uh, fight for as 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 workers um, within you know the dictates of the NLRB, right? Uh, state is is possible. So, um, and for that you need like documents, right? You need things like the American Public Health Association 2018 report that says that policing is a public health issue. You need comrades like Bill, who's here, uh, sorry to 
uh, put you in the spot, Bill, Bill Lopez, who, who uh, does this kind of research and makes the kinds of cases and arguments that, for example, in our case, somebody in HR might find legible, right? And say, oh, look, researchers at this university, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate that public, uh, uh, the policing is a public health issue, right? Uh, so those arguments all help. Um, of course, it's not only about the kinds of arguments we make when we're sitting in front of HR. Um, I think, as I think Chloe mentioned and, and other panelists mentioned, you have to build the kinds of alliances, the kinds of anomalous alliances across, uh, you know, you know, the kind of intramural spaces that we're in across campus and outside of campus as well. As I, I think Britt was mentioning that as well, like we need to come out of campus and even question what, what campus means. Um, uh, um, and so certainly it's not all about the arguments, but I think the, the kind of public health uh, kind of uh, research has been really helpful in, in framing arguments and helping membership, uh, some members move um, towards abolition. Um, I think that there, in terms of like research questions for public health as a, as a field to look into around sexual harm, um, one is that there have been some like transformative or restorative justice approaches to sexual harm cropping up around the country and also people that have been doing this kind of work for a long time. And I think that if that were to be reflected more in public health literature, that could help build more of a foundation for, for growth in, in those kinds of approaches. I think also that like there in sexual violence advocacy has been kind of a taboo around trying to understand why sexual harm is happening or like trying to um, like, yeah, understand the motivators or, or political, personal, structural context for sexual violence happening. And, and I think that like, from a public health perspective, having more research around what is it, what are, what are those factors that are leading people to, to act in these ways um, would also be, yeah, could, al could also be really eye-opening. And um, again, just from like personal, um, yeah, personal experience. I think it's been really helpful for me to think of like trying to understand why people are acting in the way that they're acting as a way of changing that behavior. And I think there's not a whole lot of like empirical research around, um, yeah, around that. So that from a public health perspective, I think that would be. Yeah, um, I've been having a lot of like internal mind conversations in thinking about this question. Um, to start off, I think um, abolition and is like fundamentally a public health issue. Um, I don't think it's something that like the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign like talks about or uses as a strategy much, but obviously as we've seen from the other panelists, like that's it's really powerful to do so um and i keep coming back to this to this like idea that you know like the way racial capitalism is, is structured and the way like police forces and prisons are structured is by like is um exposing people like to death and to premature death um in communities um and i think i think if i mean if you look at police uh, police killings, police murders, um, but also if you look like within the carceral system at like at health out outcomes, um, the results are or like the facts are like so terrible and so saddening. But I also think whenever I'm thinking about like the public health conversation is never like specifically from like a divestment and abolitionist framework, is thinking about how how to call attention to the this public health crisis without relying on arguments that would justify further putting more money into the prison industrial complex. Um, because I think people look at this and they argue for, okay, well, we need better facilities, right? Um, but these better facilities 
oftentimes like never never lead to better facilities it just leads to more money um within these systems so i think that's kind of where my mind has been drifting ever since i heard this question um and i'll i'll go to joelle yeah i agree i think there's a degree of care that probably needs to be done for the research but at the same time i mean mass incarceration strikes me as I mean, not necessarily first and foremost, but most certainly a massive public health issue, both as it relates to, I mean, physical health outcomes, but particularly mental health outcomes. I mean, I think there's so much to be said about how being locked up, I mean, beyond the part where it tears you away from your family and robs you of years of your life with them, but also physically robs you of years of your life and tears apart your mental state. So, I mean, that that's one end. I also think, I mean, Bert is right in saying that at least in our work, we don't focus on public health, probably primarily because we're all undergraduates, or at least right now we're all undergraduates. Um, and to that, I would say two things. The first is that I think that even outside of one's field of expertise, like you can be useful to to uh, projects. So even if I think I think this is an important question, but I also at the same time I think thinking about participation in abolitionism and abolitionist organizations solely in the terms of what you can what you're specialized in already isn't especially helpful because I think the, there there's a need for a lot of different things. And I think organizers are sh should be equipped to fulfill many different roles. And I also think that, yeah, well, let's put it like that. Also, I'm sorry, my cat is, uh, is has a Zoom meet. But yeah, I think that also, I'll leave it like that and I'll pass it to, to Chloe. Thanks. Um, yeah, I echo what everyone's saying. And um, as you all were talking, I was reminded um, that the one, um, actual contract that NYU had with the NYPD was for patrolling its hospitals. So I think make of that what you will, but I, I just thought that that was, um, yeah, an interesting an interesting thing that we learned. Um, and yeah, I, I think I echo the need to substantiate with kind of empirical research and evaluations, the effects of police systems on individuals. I think this can be um, so important for, for movement work. Um, but I also think, you know, more broadly, um, like expanding these discussions about what is health. Um, is it a thing that affects individual bodies or is it a collective experience? Um, you know, one thing that we were kind of trying to think about is what are the health effects of like surveillance of communities over time on mental and I'm sure physical health and, um, you know, like even taking it further, like what are the kinds of like conditions of freedom that are needed in order to be healthy? Um, and um, I think, yeah, there's like so many different directions that this can be taken, but I think um, there's so much kind of really relevant backlash against um, political speech on campuses right now in a much different way than the media is saying, of course. Um, but I think that there are, uh, there's like a need for, for people to look into things like what are, for instance, the psychological effects of seeing a, a, a Blue Lives Matter flag or an Israeli flag, for instance, for people who have had certain life experiences and why might that produce a certain kind of dissent that is, that is under threat and that people are getting student conduct violations for and are getting um, in trouble in their workplaces for and things like that. Um, and I think a lot of those um, kind of like areas of of research or inquiry, I think, come from, uh, you know, not, not they, they kind of like follow the threats that, that students and workers are under um, and those students and workers kind of like seek out, like I, I need this kind of like, um, you know, d defense mechanism or whatever um, against this, this like issue or this way that I'm, I'm trying to be punished. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's really important for, for people who are interested in public health to, you know, become more and more embedded in, in movements. And I know that um, a lot of people that I've worked with have, um, you know, wondered where the, wondered who to turn to for sort of allies in, in the, the health system. Um, so I think it's definitely really important work. Awesome, thanks y'all. Um, more questions are coming in. 
Uh, just to quickly answer your question, Gloria, we do have a Slack. I'll drop the link in the chat if folks want to join it. Um, so one question that came in uh, is from someone who's working as a staff member at a university, and they're wondering um, how best can staff support student organizing efforts? Or not to whoever wants to answer. Can I say something real quick about this? Uh, we, we had a situation here at the University of Michigan where uh, something happened with an instructor and I can't be too explicit about what happened, but something happened with an instructor and it seemed like the department was under some, one department was under kind of legal pressure to do things like, um, you know, train their members in terms of de-escalation techniques. And the staff member uh, at this department, um, you know, their first thought was, we're going to reach out to the Department of Public Safety and Security and ask them to train our train our instructors on how to do de-escalation trainings, right? <laughs> and so, obviously, you know, it's it's um, it's this kind of hammer and nail uh, thinking process, right? Um, and uh, the kind of punitive and policing uh, sort of solutions or quote unquote sol solutions that we have um, obviously do not uh, resolve our, resolve our needs, right? So maybe one way in which staff um, and staff, staff can mean broadly, you know, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that means uh, for this particular person, can try to push for alternatives to doing things like de-escalation trainings, for example, that pay uh, other forms of organizations that are not, for instance, housed within the police. Um, I think to echo kind of, I think one of Chloe's points prior to this about uh, the sort of police university uh, um, hospital connection. Uh, here at the University of, University of Michigan, we've been able to kind of scrape some data from the police, uh, the university campus police. And, you know, the main activity that cops here do is at hospitals, right? Um, and oftentimes that includes hospital staff calling the police on people, um, right? As, as I'm sure you all know, this is a big component of how campus police work um, when there's university hospitals, right? So, I think something as simple as like having a poster that says alternatives to calling the police um, on your door to finding alternative ways of doing de-escalation trainings um, for your staff and for other people might be like some things that people can do, um, I think, immediately. Thanks, Alejo. Does anybody else want to jump in on that one? I can speak on behalf of that. I actually work at a community college and I'm a faculty. And I feel that um, staff or faculty can't collaborate with students when they're working on coalition activities in terms of bringing awareness of what are their needs on campus. In sometimes clubs, student clubs, that's, that's a way um, within community college, a student club has to be sponsored from one faculty so I know that you know universities run differently and there's there's usually a student union that it's representative but students do um, also create their own clubs and that's a way you know to students can you know recruit faculty who are interested another thing that I know that our community college is doing is they're creating certificates for our faculty and um administrators to get involved in learning about um, equity and um, inequalities, you know, within healthcare to help, you know, um, come together and discuss policies that, you know, we can help collaborate and move forward in supporting our campus and our students at the same time. And the American Heart, um, the um, what's it called? American Public Health Association, you know, recently had launched their toolkit, um, you know, that um, emphasizes on what is it called? Um, their JI, which is justice, um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, addressing the whole social determinants of health. I feel that um, bringing faculty and administrators aware of how the social determinants of health affect 
um, individuals, especially who live in marginalized communities and are pursuing higher education um, is important. And, you know, that was, you know, kind of like the feedback that I can give on my behalf. Thank you guys for hearing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, cool. Sophie, let's jump to this question from working up for you um, about Denmark. And if you saw any abolitionist elements in Denmark's culture and what that was like in contrast to the US. Yeah, um, this is such an interesting question. I think, unfortunately, there can be this uh, expectation of Denmark being the perfect place. <laughs> um, and I think there's a lot of things that are very different and, um, and better, especially in terms of the welfare state and just like, that there is more uh, like a human centered approach in a lot of ways, more funding for education, uh, healthcare and, and things of that nature. But I think that similar to the US, especially when it comes to immigration, there's a really racialized idea of who deserves to be seen as a human. And like that if you are a white ethnic Dane that you are deserving of those things, those benefits uh, from, from the state, that, that welfare state. And if you're not, that um, Denmark will have a very like preemptively punitive approach to you. And um, Denmark has been sued in international human rights court for a lot of their immigration policies, um, including having like a mandatory three-year waiting period for family reunification and confiscating jewelry and valuables from refugees and just like, um, yeah, they have a very anti-immigrant policy. And I think, yeah, that has been less of an issue in the most recent elections there, but it has been, uh, serving as a model for some other far right governments in Europe, um, most recently Sweden. So I think, yeah, unfortunately, while there are some of these more progressive elements, it's also really limited in terms of who is seen as being deserving of those things. Thanks, Sophie. Um, one question, we might have room for two more questions. Um, so folks keep dropping in the chat. Um, one that we've talked a lot about before in this group, um, but I think this is the right group to ask it to is like movement sustainability on campuses. Um, so including like institutional knowledge transfer from students to students with, you know, organizers graduating, um, how you all have seen institutional knowledge passed on how, how you have tried to pass it on, um, challenges, things like that. I can kind of give like a non-answer, which is that it's very challenging. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's like this interesting thing because I think student, grad student turnover on the one hand, in some instances, like can embolden grad students to kind of take on more risks than if they were, you know, in what was conceivably like their permanent job or something. Um, of course, that's not like true across the board, but, um, but yeah, I think like the kind of history of student activism in, in the US it kind of like lends itself to, to that as like a kind of sub conclusion of other things. But um, at the same time, obviously, like I think institutions know that they like through mechanisms like delay um, that they kind of uh, delay is in favor of the institution because um, students have a lot of like turnover. Um, you know, even on, on a year to year basis, like the group of organizers is, can be vastly different. Um, and I think, you know, the role of faculty and staff can be important there. Um, I also think, um, 
like building a kind of archive of a lot of the work that is going on is like important and someone should do it. I'm certainly not doing it, but like, um, I think, you know, that that's something that, you know, cops off campus organizers are like sort of trying to do. Um, but I think, you know, we have people who like join, um, the labor group that I'm part of for Cops Off Campus. And they're like, do you have any examples of contract language around this point? And we're kind of like, well, like it is probably somewhere. Um, so I do think just like building, I don't know, knowledge passes down in, in various ways that I think are, are hard to point to. And you hear stories about past organizers and you, you speak to people, but I think um, a lot of the kind of like written and strategic documents that can be useful are not. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, people putting an effort into, um, even writing about their experiences, um, I think can be, can be really helpful to actually have something tangible to pass along to other people. Oh, <laughs> no, <go ahead. laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I, I want to echo first kind of the non-answer of that. It's really, really hard. It's in, incredibly hard. Um, um, similarly, we have grad students that are here for two years. We have undergrads that are here for four years. Um, our, the, the, one of our, uh, the co-founders of HPDC graduated last year. I think, um, the archival work is important, but also like, for example, uh, we have, um, a drive with all of our, our documents in it, but once you have that, it becomes like a web of like a, like of things that you can't understand. So I think like one thing that we tried really hard to do this year was creating like a system to that where we know um, where everything is going next. But I think another thing is that like being in contact with people past the time that they graduate can really help. For example, just proof that institutional memory is hard. I we got locked out of our our Zoom account last week because um one of the people who had graduated was the phone number on the Zoom account. Um and we didn't have the like the password that we needed basically. But because like the these relationships are more than just organizing relationships, we can we can reach out and say, "Hey, like we're struggling with this. Can can you give me this information um or can we come up with a solution?" And also, like, there are so many people that have, like, so much, so much knowledge that they, it's not like they disappear off the face of the earth whenever they graduate, you know? Um, yeah. I think I, have, I, I agree it is really difficult, and it's a problem that we're actually dealing with right now. I would say probably I would have two suggestions, which the first of which would be to constantly be recruiting. Um, and I think especially recruiting people who are on campus for a longer time, although I think anyone definitely, even people who are on campus only for a few years has a place in the movement. Uh, but second, I would say is also to make sure that organizing work and just like organization activities more generally aren't a chore, ensuring that um, the, uh, the group feels like a community, that it, it feels like a place where you can be yourself. I think that's pretty critical to ensuring that there is less turnover year to year with with people rather not as they graduate, but as they you know have take on other responsibilities. Yeah. Can I say something real quick about this as well? Um, just to add to it, what's been said, partly in jest and partly uh, truly, is that um, you know, like don't leave where you're at. <laughs> and there's a there's a there's a big. Uh, um, basically, I've, I've done that by keep doing degrees at the University of Michigan. So I've been here for like 10 years. Um, I'm not, that's not something I recommend. I probably should have, you know, done therapy instead of keep doing PhDs. But the, the point the point is that um, we have, I think in the academy in particular, there's a, like a way in which we're really pressured to leave where we're at. Um, and, you know, even as an undergrad, I, I had so many friends and comrades that actually fought really hard to stay where they, they were at. Um, and, you know, you know, in, in ways that uh, that maybe were not um, uh, so conducive to the kind of professional life that the academy wants to sell to us, right? Um, so it's difficult uh, to do that, but that's one way to do it. Um, 
And another thing I like to add is that sometimes archives and archiving things uh, can get in the wrong hands as well. Uh, and so we have to think about the ways in which we do it that um, is encrypted or secure in some, in some ways. And that's been an issue in part a lot uh, for people that work with prisoners, obviously, right? Um, um, yeah, that's a separate issue. Uh, you know, what you, you do with letters, you scan letters, where do you put them, right? Um, so institutional knowledge is good, but the archive can also be, you know, potentially in some cases, a weapon used against you, right? So you have to find ways of, of making that, um, um, you know, um, not, not, easy, not easy access a lot by, by the enemy, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. I think like security culture is such a huge and important thing for organizing on campus, off campus, everywhere. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you brought that into this. Can I just jump in with one quick thing? I think um, too that like having a culture of mentorship or like um, identifying people that you want to develop their leadership and having those people in turn have an eye towards developing new leaders is also important. I think, yeah, that was one of the things that I tried to do in the last like year or two that I was at the university. And um, yeah, I think I would just recommend that people try and do leadership development as well. Thank you, yeah. Um, okay, so two questions just came in in the chat. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, this first one. How have you all dealt with conflict in the movement? So either internally in your own groups or with other groups on campus um, who might be aligned or not aligned. Um, so I'm gonna throw that out to all of you. If anyone has an answer to Jeremy's question, I wanna throw that in the chat because you probably won't have time to answer that out loud. Um, go for that too, but conflict. Um, I can speak to the conflict thing real quick. Um, like from the position of like, we dealt with conflict really badly kind of um, around like ruptures within the union around people who um, wanted to like push cops off campus forward as a, an issue and people who did it. And I think um, one of the things that I learned from that is to um, not assume that you are in agreement with people on all issues if you're in agreement with them on some issues and I think like people who had worked together for a really long time in um, a union setting who you know agreed a lot about like a lot of a labor issues um I think like um yes yeah, assuming that 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 we all sort of like were aligned politically on every point I think um kind of worked in our disfavor in terms of building solidarity. And I think like even with trusted allies, like to continue to have these sorts of discussions um, and to kind of proceed at the pace of, um, at, of trust always, you know, I think that that is, is really important. Um, and, um, you know, also just because people have different like knowledge of different sort of like areas of social justice and stuff. And there's a lot of, um, you know, pressure from from different areas of people's lives, and there are reasons why people might, um, yeah, agree with sort of uh, some issues, like on paper or something, but not agree strategically. And and these kinds of things can get in the way. I think if if you're not sort of always um, like consciously rebuilding the relationships that you already have, I think. Um, and um, yeah, and it's, I think it's always best to do that like earlier rather than later. I think, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, thinking about conflict earlier rather than later, um, I think in a lot of the movement spaces that I've been in, there's been kind of a conflict avoidance or like a culture of conflict avoidance and just hoping that everyone will be aligned and nothing will come up. Um, and I think, yeah, in retrospect, having an expectation that conflict will occur and that actually conflict can be generative and that like 
conflict can move us towards something better and uh, trying to create a container that allows for that kind of conflict. Um, and I feel like, yeah, that's something that I'm currently trying to work towards both in movement spaces and personal spaces. And um, yeah, I can drop some resources in the chat in terms of like ways of thinking about that. But um, yeah, I think having the like uh, structure for the out from the outset, or at least the expectation from the outset that like, oh, we actually can have disagreements and uh, that that actually could be good for our movement is a good place to start from. Thanks, Sophie. Britt, Joelle, Alejo, any last thoughts on that one? Yeah, I can talk a bit. I think, I think um, two things. I, so uh, HPDC is a non-hierarchical organization um so everything like we don't have like like a, a leader or anything like that um and i i think almost all of um our actions we do like by coming to consensus um and talking through like whether everyone um like someone comes up with an action idea we talk about how people feel about it how or like what people people's thoughts are um i think it's really good um in that like it teaches you how to compromise um and it also like um makes you more reflective on your work so you don't rush into something and then cause harm i think at the same time it is a slower process right and it's harder um and then i think the other thing is at the at the same point at the same time like we are fundamentally an abolitionist organization um so always standing with those those boundaries uh um, and those values and whenever we're working with within like within coalition work, um, et cetera. Um, if, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. I guess I'll just add that um, it's, 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 it's definitely, um, a different way to navigate conflict when you have sort of affinity groups and affinities of the kind that maybe Britt was mentioning. Um, I think Chloe also mentioned that you got to move at the speed of trust. But in, in a lot of mass organizations, like you know, uh, a place like the union where there's lots of people that you don't necessarily trust, they don't necessarily know, it becomes really difficult, right? <laughs> so this is a very important question to to deal with, and especially I I think in a kind of political culture in which disagreement is frowned upon or conflict is frowned upon or disagreement is, is confused for conflict, uh, for example. Um, it is particularly important to maybe distinguish between like principal disagreements um, and, and conflict on the one hand. Um, and, and that's very difficult to do uh, because, um, you know, politics are tangled up with, with, with people's existence in all sorts of ways. And so it's difficult to disentangle them sometimes as hard as that, as that might be. Uh, that we can disagree on certain things, um, but not not on everything, right? Not everything is up for discussion. Not everything can be disagreed upon, and so it's difficult to be able to sort of make those distinctions and try to, uh, nonetheless, still distinguish conflict from disagreements, principal disagreement, right? Um, so maybe that's that's what I'll say is like being able to kind of isolate: is this is this happening because of something else that's happening? Um, uh, uh, that's maybe interpersonal, right? Um, um, and again, you know, people might say, well, uh, but everything is political in some respects. Yes, but uh, we have to be able to distinguish between different positions and maybe vote in some senses, right? Between uh, uh, different uh, avenues, right? For, 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 for an organization that is not, uh, is not gonna get to mass consensus, right? When you have a thousand people, right? Um, at least not within the kind of framework uh, or time 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 frame that that we want to right. Um, so I just want to throw that example out there because it's a little different from the kind of affinity group type model that um, maybe some of us are more used to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there time for me to add one small point to that? Um, yeah, I, I think all of your answers like made me sort of think about this more, and I also just wanted to add that like, um, yeah, like remaining on the 
right side of, of history and like, or like by that, I mean, kind of like sticking to your principles and not kind of confusing the resolution of conflict with compromise, you know, and like is, for instance, is, is a conflict um, with like the UAW something that we want to resolve or like, you know, come to like a solution or, or like mediate, or is that conflict something that we want to um, like win, you know, is that like a struggle that we want to be like the winners of? Um, and um, yeah, I think like in organizing culture and like in union organizing culture specifically, um, those things can get um, like politeness can get um, kind of like mixed in in a way that is, that sometimes needs to be, to be um, push back against for sure. Yeah, thank you. That's an important point. Um, yes, there's stuff ongoing at APHA this week, actually, that is around that. Um, cool. I appreciate you all for being here and for sharing all of this. Thank you. Um, I, once we finish this, we'll shut off the recording. If anyone wants to stick around and talk about things not being recorded, um, please feel free to do that. Um, Amber, can you stick up the last couple slides? Thank you. Um, so first wanna say that we are, uh, we have launched the application for the spring 2023 cohort of the network. Um, this one is gonna be, this cohort will be focused on, um, on organizing on their campuses. So organizing abolitionist campaigns on your campuses. Um, Again, asking folks to apply in groups or in pairs um, so that you have folks that you're organizing with. Um, and each school, we're giving a small stipend to, um, to help cover some campaign costs. So um, if you're interested in applying for this, this is the link. Um, I'll drop that in the chat also. Um, please do, please apply. That's the application I just put in the chat. Um, also, all of our speakers, feel free to apply for it also. <laughs> um, and then the last thing, next slide, thank you, is that our final political ed session for this um, iteration of the, of the network will be Wednesday, December 7th. So we're going to be skipping the um, November 23rd and going to December 7th. Um, so I'll send out some reminders about that, but just so you know, that's when the next one is please join. Um, and yeah, thank you again to speakers. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all the organizing that you're doing um, and that you have done on your campuses. It's just, yeah, it's incredibly needed and I'm grateful to know that folks are out there doing it. Um, and if we can be a resource at all for you, please um, reach out to. Um, cool. Thank you also to our captioners. Thank you to folks for showing up. Uh, that's it. Have a good rest of your day. I'm going to shut off the recording. If folks want to stick around, please do.